Hi, everyone. I'm Zahava Avend, head of LA Miami. Thanks so much for joining us today for the second episode of our LE Digital series, The Power of the Collective. As all of us in the travel industry right now continue to navigate the impact of COVID-19, we wanted to bring together some of our most seasoned leaders to discuss how our industry has weathered previous crises and what we can learn from those times as we craft our post-COVID recovery strategies. As with all our LE Digital content, this live session is designed to provide you with tangible takeaways for your businesses and your teams. We will follow our panel discussion with an open Q&A, so please submit your questions for our speakers using the Q&A function that's located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, now, let me tell you a little bit about our speakers that we have today. Um, we're thrilled to have Nancy Novograd with us today as our session leader. Nancy served as the editor-in-chief of Travel and Leisure magazine for over two decades and now curates luxury trips for private clients through Culturati Travel Design. Welcome, Nancy. Um, Nancy's going to be chatting today with Ted Molnar, a crisis management expert and former Navy SEAL who actually now helps lead Redpoint Travel Insurance. Thank you so much, Ted, for joining us. And finally, last but not least, um, we have Emily Snyder with us today. And Emily is our senior, or is the senior vice president of global sales at Mandarin Oriental Hotel Group. She currently leads eight of the global offices for the group and actually previously successfully steered the Ritz Carlton Central Park through the tragedy of 9 11 and then the SARS epidemic. Um, mm -hmm. So, Emily, thank you also for being here with us today. We're really excited to have you all here. And um, just a minute, I'm gonna actually turn this over to Nancy and I'm gonna pop off and join all of you watching today's conversation. So good luck guys and thanks again. <laughs> Thank you Zahava and hello everyone. Um, I thought I would start off because these panelists have in interesting pasts by asking them each where they were and what they were doing during 9-11 and, and uh, the global financial collapse of 2008. So Ted, why don't you start? Sure, well thank you Nancy and Ellie Miami for um, bringing us all together. It's a, a wonderful opportunity to speak with you all. 9-11 um, was an interesting time for me. On uh, September 10th, I was uh, training with the SEAL platoon out of Coronado um, obviously September 11th, 11th happened and at the 10th we were scheduled to uh, deploy to Southeast Asia uh, in, the, in the following nine months or so. Uh, on the 12th my deployment had been uh, cycled up and moved quickly uh, forward um, to move to the Middle East theater. Uh, it was a really interesting time for us all. We hadn't really been in sustained combat for um, well since since really Vietnam and um, uh, little did we know that 20 years later, we'd still be involved in, in this crisis, but um, uh, it, it certainly changed the, the tenor of, of, uh, of what our military has done or had done at that time and, and uh, certainly changed a lot of what I was doing. Thank you. And Emily, uh, tell us about your past. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, Nancy, it's a great question because I had the incredible career timing of taking a new job two weeks before 9-11 to open the Ritz-Carlton Central Park. And I was actually downtown. Our pre-opening offices were downtown that day. Of course, this will stick in our memories forever, but it was quite an interesting time to launch a luxury hotel back then. Yeah, I remember that launch actually <laughs> very well. We had just toured the property from Travel and Leisure. So Ted and Emily, now I want to know what you're responsible for in this latest and very devastating crisis in your your work, Ted. Well, today today I um, I help uh, lead uh, Redpoint Travel Insurance. Um, so we provide travel insurance solutions to luxury, leisure, uh, and adventure travelers who are, um, many of whom who are leaving the U.S. Uh, to travel to unique and interesting places uh, overseas. So <clears throat> uh, leading up to this and, and moving through these crises, that, uh, that's my main job function. Yeah, and Emily. I oversee, as, uh, as I have a say, global sales offices. I have 50 sales uh, leaders. They're out there selling, still selling, connecting with the clients as well as assisting with the reopening of all of our hotels in the U.S. and Europe that are currently closed right now. So we're working on those recovery plans day by day. Yeah. Well, you're, you're both in interesting places to observe what's <coughs> going on. And 
from your past and, and what you know about crisis recovery, what do you think the most challenging aspects of recovery from this crisis will be? You want me to start with yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead, Ted. Um, well, so I think that um, some of the challenging scenarios we all have is, is um, we, 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 we get uh, pushed into a stagnation phase and um, there's, there's hope that, um, that something will happen, something will change, such that our business industry, our, our individual business or industry as a whole will, will change and enable our business to, to propel itself back to, I guess, pre-March um, uh, schedules. Um, and so uh, what I've seen in the past is, is, um, is, is frankly stagnation and, um, and inability of, of some, some folks, some businesses to move beyond the reality um, and process data in such a way that can be helpful to, the, to allow the business to move forward. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. And Emily? You know, I think in this crisis, the likes of which we've never seen, it's global, it's affected everybody. You know, it's trying to absorb everything that's going on all at once, maintaining that calm uh, and, and starting to put together a plan to move forward. And for me, you know, what's the biggest challenge, of course, is you, you no longer have the clients in the hotel, but you have your colleagues, right? So it's the, the internal and external stakeholders that you're trying to lead through it together and listen and put a plan together and act on it. That's really been the challenge for me is just keeping that all together and moving forward. I mean, we are still selling, we're still working behind the scenes. Um, you know, it's a different type of sell. We're still doing business though, and then trying to overarching, how will we get these hotels back up and running and, and you know, moving forward in their local yeah. community. I'm now on the seller of travel side yes. and, and I'm interested in, unlike before when I was the journalist, I'm now seeing this enormous coming together of different parts of the travel industry and com companies that are competitors sharing information and best practices. And can you talk about how community uh, opportunities can can increase and and help um, in in this crisis I think it's incredible that just the opportunity to be together but the whole social media the role that's playing in us now right that we're reaching out the b2c to the to consumers we're reaching out to our partners our travel agencies our corporate clients and using social media to really share in this together. Um, I think that's been an incredible opportunity for all of us. I mean, who thought we'd all learn to cook these past couple of weeks? You know, we had <laughs> chefs on and that sort of thing and yoga and mindfulness and wellness. So just that alone, it's almost coming together as one fraternal organization that perhaps wasn't there prior, really made us take stock and look at and address that. Yeah. And do you feel, I mean, let's talk for a minute about what the government did Yes. in in the past with the um with 911 and the financial crisis that would be great if they could get in motion now i know we're talking about different governments uh, but yeah. <laughs> you know, i'm most familiar <laughs> with yeah. what's going on in the us yeah i'd love to answer that if i could i think you know for me after 911 to watch michael bloomberg the mayor at the time really take the lead on that uh, and, you know, he was never really honored for all the money he personally invested to hire the PR agencies there throughout the globe to get people to come back to New York to show that it was safe to come enjoy the city, to come shopping. Um, that really, we were able to respond to that very quickly and get things running. We weren't expecting that right in January. Who wanted to come to New York City? So uh, in the cold, but he managed that. And that was a great leadership and an effort that everybody gathered together and worked through that. And you know, it didn't take that long for the city to come back. And we opened that hotel. I remember it was tax day, April 15th, uh, hmm. 2002, right? And we managed to pull it through the first quarter. It was an incredible effort by a lot of people. Well, that's great. And Ted, yeah. Um, you're, you're seeing things for the, through the lens of your insurance company, but um, you're working with a lot of uh, sellers of travel. And what are you seeing now in terms of their recovery and opportunities? 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's, I think if I could just uh, flip back to the, the comments that Emily made, which are, I think are, are really good ones, but I, you know, in government interaction as well, obviously we saw um, a, a lot of investment um, in our economy from our government. And we also saw um, a good deal of, of uh, work done in the creation of, of national security uh, at our borders and, uh, and specifically at airports, uh, which was critical to uh, reestablishing the, the trust and, and, uh, and the safety. Uh, so that was a national security issue, not just for the U.S., but, but for everybody around the world, um, frankly. And, and back to your previous question, it was that type of collaboration worldwide that enabled the travel industry to really rebound um, and, and rebound fairly quickly given the, the size and scale of that unknown problem. Uh, and I think, you know, today it's, um, it's, it's not the same problem, but it's really a health security, which, which, uh, which really parlays directly into our, you know, world security. And, and that's, you know, the problem that we need to, to really focus on and fix today. Our governments have invested heavily around the world in, in, uh, in our businesses and, and in individuals. And they'll continue to do that, um, but from our from our travel perspective, um, it's that it's identifying that health security imp impact uh, that really I think is going to have a, a substantial impact on on creating that the ease um, of people to to start traveling again. Uh, so what we're seeing today, um, we're actually starting to see, thankfully, um, people start booking trips, which is great as as the economies start start to open up. Uh, worldwide, uh, Sweden uh, being a good good example of that, um, and and domestic travel, um, you know, uh, again off of Emily's comments in New York, where I think we're going to see a lot of states that are going to um, that are going to apply the same types of of uh, PR um, type of campaigns to visit national parks or or uh, visit California and, and all the great great beaches and such. But we are starting to see a, an uptick in bookings, which is fantastic. Uh, I think, like all of us, uh, business changed substantially in March, um, and so we certainly hope that that this uptick continues for us all. Thanks. Um, well, what about? Can we talk a little bit about the difference of bus for businesses that deal with consumers? Uh, in recovery against businesses that are dealing with other businesses the suppliers that so many of us are dependent on and um there it was i read somewhere that they may have a harder time in this recovery than than hotels and i i do you have any thoughts on that i ted when you say you're seeing uh trips are you seeing long trips or uh, what I'm thinking is that what will happen first is shorter trips to yeah. hotels and resorts rather than the kinds of trips that you might need a, a DMC for. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's, that's right. I think we're going to, we're going to see, and we are seeing shorter duration trips. Um, now we work in the luxury leisure adventure travel markets. So it's a pretty wide range. Um, and the adventure travel markets are um, just by nature of those types of trips often longer. Um, nonetheless, I think the, um, the population of travelers will change initially as well. Uh, you know, I think as we all know, um, there's a lot of generational travel that we see uh, around the world and, and there will be pieces of that generational trip uh, most likely the grandparents, maybe uh, older parents as well that will that will opt out of those scenarios. But in talking to, to many of our partners as well, um, they're actually finding that even within the generational travelers, um, generational travelers, uh, especially the grandparents, uh, continue to be very interested um, in as long as the Pro appropriate protective measures can be put in place continually continue to be very interested in, in moving forward with that scheduled travel. It may not be this summer, but, but certainly next, next summer, um, they're, they're, they're starting to look at and plan for those opportunities. Well, people are certainly dreaming about travel now and, and reading up on it. And yeah. so I hope that turns out well for us. Emily, are you, what are you seeing from yeah. the Mandarin? 
perspective. Well, it's interesting to me, um, you know, there's sort of two parts to that question. Yes, we're opening in Lago de Como this summer. We're very excited. Mid-June, we're looking. It's not official yet. Uh, our beautiful resort in Bodrum, Turkey, late May. I mean, we're, bookings are coming in. People are dreaming, uh, hearing a lot of trends about beach vacations. I think we could all use one once we're done with this. <laughs> Um, and I and I think it's it's interesting too the dream aspect. I heard a great story the other day where a travel agent hosted her clients, you know, a Zoom cocktail party, and they and she got bookings out of that, right? Talking and listening oh. and sharing this, you know, uh, memories. So when you have a call like this, everybody can talk together. So I think people are starting to really plan. I mean, we can't wait to get back out there. Uh, and as I said, we're starting to really see the corporate business, the group business starting to confirm in Q4 and next year. So things haven't stopped. You know, it's a, it's an adjustment, right? We're adjusting to a new way forward. And I think if we listen to the clients, right, what are they asking us? It's the hygiene, the cleanliness, the flexibility yes. on cancellations, um, those sort of things. Listen to the clients. We address that. We get the airlines back to flying. Things will start to ramp up pretty quickly. You know, that's the big challenge, I think, for all of us is when the planes are going to start taking off again. Well, if you had to come up with some suggestions for jump-starting travel, the yeah. economy travel, enabling travel to begin again based on the past, um, and you've already mentioned uh, the issue of stagnation, Ted, inability to move forward, but what do we do to make sure that that things go back on course and that we can emerge from this based on what we know about the past? Yeah, it, it, um, a, a very good question, I, I think. Um, and I, I think I would address it less as a, this is what I would um, specifically, this initiative is what I'd specifically recommend, but instead look at it in really management frameworks and kind of coming back to the stagnation piece that I talked about um, you know, the military is a place where we have to make or formally had to make uh, decisions all the time with imperfect information. And you have to, you have, to um, uh, have a sense of comfort, if you can, around making those decisions and analyzing the information with that um, and then making a follow-on decision with that, with that imperfect data uh, and then executing upon it. So I break it really down into, into frameworks that I'd recommend that, that businesses, if they're not already doing, um, move forward with and implement. And these are not unique. Uh, the military um, works in these, in these formats on a daily basis. Uh, we've all heard of these concepts and strategies, but um, broadly speaking, it, it breaks down into a, a really three formats that I would talk about. One is a, a decision-making format. Two is a management um, uh, structure. And three is is communication. So when I come back up to decision making, I think about it as a as a gear and putting in place a structure whereby businesses can constantly analyze new information, move to decisions quickly, and execute and then repeat. And that's specifically applicable, I think, in these crisis environments. If you go back to like a Jim Collins type uh, scenario, there's a lot of commonalities with this flywheel and this gear. You want to keep that flywheel or this gear turning uh, crises around these specific issues so that we can continue to create momentum in our businesses. The momentum, uh, believe it or not, or at least I believe in what I found in the military, uh, makes, makes organizations agile so that when change continues to come, you'll be much more capable and, and able amend to that change, make decisions based upon the information that's, uh, that's new or that your people are seeing, and then, and then execute on those. And then, and then finally, the, the uh, management piece. You know, we, we as leaders of our businesses are spending probably 80, 90 percent of our time in scenarios like these, talking to industry, talking to partners about uh, what's going on. And, and, and we need to create the structures within our businesses to enable uh, those who work within our organizations to make decisions um, and creating those those boundaries or those left and right frameworks so that um, that their stagnation uh, doesn't occur so um, and, th and then from a communication standpoint we we need to be communicating today more than we've ever communicated in the past with our with our teams 
it is so critical. These types of meetings where uh, we can see and talk to people and make sure that we understand and look into pe people's eyes, um, they really reinforce the, the analysis that I talked about, uh, the communication of those decisions and, and the action, as well as, as well as the decision making within the management structure. So, so what I would say is to that question, sorry about being so long, um, but from my experience, it's, it's about those three, th three facets. It's the decision making and creation of that gear that continues to turn. Uh, creating the, setting the management conditions such that your people can make decisions and move things forward and, and communicating and communicating in such a way, not just to your clients, but within your internal stakeholders such that they can be effective in their, in their job functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well that, I mean, I, I see communication as super important, yeah. uh, inside and out. I mean, I have an experience, maybe Emily can comment on this, where I had to change a reservation for um, a honeymoon, and I got one note from the reservations department, I was changing it to next year, saying that, you know, yes, we'll change the reservation, but there, there will be an additional cost because of 2021 prices. And then I got a second email right away saying, sorry, um, there won't be any difference in the pricing. And so, I, you know, it's so, because so much is happening so fast, it seems yeah. crucial to get everyone to speak with the same tongue and, you know, to communicate within your organization what your policies are. Uh, can you talk about that, Emily? Yeah, I mean, that was one of the first things we did was respond to that uh, because everybody just started to cancel, right? Everybody's experienced that and come back with a flexible cancellation policy. People wanted to hear that, that, uh, you know, we would refund and we would ensure we would, you know, hope to welcome them back soon and just leave that, that, that guest with the, with, uh, you know, that trust in the brand, we're here to work with you. And that was the number one thing they said, they wanted that flexibility. We've actually just extended that to the end of June. And as far as our group clients have gone, we, we are out there saying, you know, you can book with us now. And until you have 30 days to cancel, it's a promotion we have out there booking with confidence. And we're actually closing business with that because the clients want to hear exactly what you said, Nancy. They want that yeah. commitment, you know, that, they, that they're they flexible. It's a luxury five-star product, yes. and we want to be able to work with you, but we don't know what's going to happen. So you, it's the part of what you were saying about listen, listen, listen to your clients and, and adapt to it, and both your external and, and internal inter, internal clients, too. Well, we're the... I was not in this field, exact field then, yeah. and I'm not aware what kind of flexibility there was with hotels and bookings in the early, earlier crises, in the earlier 2000s. And um, Emily, were there, was there this kind of no. leniency? No, because no. it's such a global pandemic. And I think everybody's had to work together to get through it. I mean. Our, our competitors, our friends these days, our friends, I mean, everybody's working together to align with that. You just, you know, it, it's brand damaging if you're going to be strict with those sort of things. And, you know, we don't have the pre-bookings with Mandarin. <clears throat> it is a flexible cancellation. And as I said, we're going to stick with that till we get through it. Yeah. And we have to adjust to it every week. We look at it and see how the booking pace is going. You know, um, it seems to me that what is really crucial now and probably was crucial then in the past is a, to communicate a kind of authenticity and concern for your clients and, and the world you exist in to, to maintain your position by seeming to care deeply about your your audience and um i wonder ted you know you were in a slightly different part of <laughs> the world during that time but it there must be uh lessons from military life that have to do with this kind of community um authenticity and concern yeah this, there there really are i mean you know that um we're only as strong as uh, is our weakest link, right? 
And, uh, and that is the case in every business, uh, in every family structure, and in every unit that we're in in the military. Um, so that authentic authenticity that you talk about, um, the realness as you approach problems, um, the, uh, the, the direction and focus that is placed on individuals, um, whether they be clients or whether they be people within your own unit, is terribly important um, at, at these times because everybody's very worried, not just about their families, but, but about their jobs on a go forward basis. So uh, I think the more, like you said, Nancy, we can be real in those conversations with, with our internal and external stakeholders, our, our customers that are coming to us for bookings um, or our internal employees as we communicate with them, I think the better we're all gonna be um, down the line. This is a, as you guys have both said, this is a, this is at the global scale. So, um, we're, we're, we've reached new heights that we've, that we've never seen and, and hopefully we will never ever see again. And as leaders of industry and leaders of businesses, we need to be conscious of the impact that's having on, on the other people who, who work within our organizations. Um, and I, and I frankly think a lot of that just, comes back to that communication topic that we talked about early. it's yeah. earlier. It's, it's really making sure that we are providing the time and the space and creating the landscape for those types of conversations to happen, whereby you're asking the junior person on a call the question first, because yeah. you want to make sure that that junior person knows that their, uh, their, their opinion is valued. Um, and oftentimes, frankly, they, they're not, they're not stuck in that group think yet. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Emily, did you see um, in the past, was there the kind of sharing of information that's happening now? And, and were partnerships created between different businesses in terms of fi to look for solutions? Or is this, uh, it seems to be going on now. I mean, yeah. there seems to be much more sharing than I was ever aware of, but yeah, it did it's this incredible. begin. Yeah, how everybody's coming together. Um, you know, I hate to say we have time because everything stopped. But what I think is fantastic is the creativity that comes out of this crisis, right? I'm as astonished. Um, I do town hall meetings with my team. Everybody's on the call. Everybody calls them from every time zone. And just the camaraderie that we're getting uh, from that is, is extraordinary. What comes out of that, and as Ted said, right, from the junior person all the way up, it's, it's amazing. Um, the creativity, the flexibility, the empowerment to go ahead and do things that we wouldn't have done two or three months ago. Um, and we're working right now, actually, with this crisis in Hong Kong, which you might remember, mass protests have been going on. <laughs> they haven't had it easy lately. Uh, and there's an example, right, where all of those heritage hotels have come together, Peninsula, the Shang, the Rosewood, um, to work on a plan to get people to go back to Hong Kong. And there's Cafe Pacific at, you know, 95% reduction in capacity, pulling together everybody and calling each other friends. It's a friendship. They're not even saying it's a collaboration. It's extraordinary what comes out of that because we're all in it together, right? We want to get everybody back to work. We want to get everybody back outside. Uh, that's That's really been extraordinary to watch in this, this situation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd like, we don't have much time left, but I'd like to hear from you both um, a reflection on what was done in the past that worked and what mistakes were made and so that people can come away with uh, an action plan or the beginnings of one and, and avoid some of the pitfalls along the way. Yeah. So, um, Ted, do you, do you have any thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't, um, at the risk of being repetitive, um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I do believe that there's so much out of our control um, in, in this particular crisis. Um, we, we can't control um, the development of a vaccine. Um, any of us on this call, maybe, maybe there are some people involved, um, but more than likely, 
the individual impact is probably going to be relatively small. I certainly know my impact in that area is going to be small. Um, and so, you know, our, our global, global footprint there may be, may be small, but there are so many other things that we can do to, um, like Emily was saying, to, to move the ball forward within our individual businesses and make sure that we continue to move that crank in such a way that we create mo momentum um, and such that we enable our businesses to remain agile. Um, the, the movement is, is, is very important. We talked about stagnation at the, at the start. And, and that, you know, for me is, is where I've seen the largest problem. And, you know, if you come back to what Emily said about the different coalitions or associations, if you will, it's just been absolutely tremendous to see uh, organizations like This Is Beyond or USTOA or ETC or, or any, of the, any of the others out there um, that have brought the communities together uh, to create those friendship bonds uh, amongst competitors, historical competitors, uh, and to share information. So you look at Wynn as an example, Wynn Hotels as an example, and sharing uh, their reopening plan. You know, these are things that are historic, things that we have never seen before, whereby uh, I, I believe as we continue to, to have these types of, of, of opportunities to share and collaborate, we're going to come out of this uh, in a much better fashion and much faster um, when when things do start to open up and airlines do start to fly again. So maybe it doesn't necessarily directly answer your question, but I, I think leads back to, you know, hopefully some of the summation of, of my thoughts on uh, the broad conversation and challenges going ahead and, and the way we can combat some of them. All right, Emily. <laughs> Well, I had another great career highlight, great timing in that uh, I became director of sales and marketing of the Mandarin New York back in September of 07, uh, excuse me, 07, 08. We all know what happened during the financial meltdown and realization that, you know, talk about stagnation. We couldn't. There was not, you know, no one was going to help us come out of that. And it goes back to sitting down with the team and listening to everybody, front office, uh, concierge, uh, reception everybody sales marketing catering and coming up with a plan what could we do how could we bring the business back where were the markets and it, you know at that point in time people just weren't spending they weren't going to europe um, so we figured out the drive market we came up with this very clever package drive in stay late it's still out there at some hotels i'm marketing that to get people to come back to new york come stay at the mandarin live in this beautiful environment uh you know sort of the romantic uh, essence of a nice long weekend in new york city and it really took off, but that was, I always talk about, that was a collaborative effort where everybody, yeah. everybody was listened to, everybody felt free to offer up their opinions. And we pulled ourselves out of it by the end of the year, we'd gotten back to where we needed to be from a numbers perspective. Um, so I well, always look back on that as a great, a great time I mean, to really have, show your leadership and listen, listen to your, your team. Well, I have some questions actually from uh, people who've been listening in. And one of them is for you, Emily, very specifically about strategies you are implementing at your hotels now to get business on the books in the immediate future. In the future. So we're coming out with a staycation package. Um, but more importantly, we're reaching out to the local communities to see how we could tie in perhaps with art museums, uh, yoga studios, um, concert halls, you know, their guests are our guests. So how are we going to work locally? Um, there's a great new thing happening in Boston, Love from Boston, where they're using their local purveyors. So really, it's a local community outreach and, you know, and giving back to the community right here in London. They're giving the mini bar contents to the frontline workers. I mean, who would want to treat like that? Uh, so it's really, you know, working those local contacts. And again, we're in this environment where we've never been so open to trying things new, trying things different. And uh, I mean, let's hope it works, right? Let's hope we start to see results from that. But that's what we're doing right now is looking at more local marketing partners and listening, you know, listening to our clients and what they want. I do want to say one interesting thing, you know, a big mistake from the past was hotels would lower their rates, right? We would all be in this bidding war. We've actually had our corporate clients come to us and say, just hold the rates, hold the rates. We don't want discounts. Yeah. We're going to be there for you. You know, they don't know when their business is going to come back. But that has been, uh, that's yeah. to me. You never would have heard that in a former life. Yeah. Um, so, but bravo. We will do that for them, of course. Uh, you know, and from the agency side, when we get back to that, we support the agents. Uh, you know, we get the agents to come see us again, experience us. 
um, you know, allow the influencers. And so we give that confidence back to travel and get the commissions paid, right? That's what we want to do. So that's how we're looking to um, overcome that. As, as Thanks. It's, it's so, a marathon, not a sprint, but we're, we're going to yeah. get yeah um there's a question for me about what have i been hearing from hotels as far as offers and communications to get bookings and we've been hearing a lot i mean including a little bit about what you're doing emily and um hotels are in general coming up with lots of different packages and opportunities special you know pay now, uh, save later yeah. plans and lot and, and great um, new ideas. I mean, what has struck me is how forthright they, many hotels are being in communicating their, how little they know about reopening when people will come. Uh, there are, as Ted mentioned, uh, WINS communication about procedures and policies in terms of health and cleanliness, and hotels are being very open about that. Uh, new, if it's a large resort with lots of places that, um, for dining, they're trying to bring people out of the dining rooms yes. and in, uh, into the property. Right. Um, and also uh, doing away with buffets. Um, yeah. yeah. And yep. um, on in terms of, um, of new solutions. But we see that hotels that are you know, the resorts that have a lot of property and different accommodations are really, um, really playing on that in their, in presenting opportunities to be there, but not be with other people right. so much. Right, right. So anyway, Ted, a question for you is um, what are some of the creative ideas uh, you have been discussing with your, uh, your market in, in the travel world in terms of insurance? I know Redpoint has been pretty aggressive in, in marketing plans that are, you know, maybe beyond some other insurance travel plans. Uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think there's some some thought and philosophy that uh, um, on the back end of this, there'll be substantial change in terms of uh, coverage terminology, uh, things that are included or or, or excluded, um, new policies that uh, that will that will be in place. Um, there's uh, been also a lot of discussion on cancel for any reason, um, as I think as we all know, and a lot of writing on that. You know, the, the reality is it's it's hard to make any decisions um, within a crisis on these types of things and um, you know where whereas um, uh, you know we have the existing policies uh, policies are written in in the 50 states in, in particular uh, in the US and, and required from a regulatory standpoint to be that way I think it will really um, we'll, we'll see more of that innovation on the back end of this crisis once we really know what the financial implications are, and uh, and and at that point there'll be some probably some unique policies that are put in place is my guess. Um, I think it's too early, frankly, Nancy, for uh, for us to really know uh, what will happen on our end if there be any new products that will come from Redpoint or others, but. But I imagine that that there will be th those in the market that will uh, that will present themselves once we're through this. Well, one more question for you, Ted, <laughs> is what are the greatest risks that suppliers in the travel industry must overcome, and do you have suggestions for how they can do so? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I um, I think the greatest risks are just frankly doing nothing. Um, I I I think that everything is going to change on a go forward basis and we all know that back to emily's point on collaboration and and, and really working together uh suppliers i believe um i think if 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 we all continue to move things forward and create bookings and create new wonderful opportunities for people to travel whether they be in small groups or or other um 
if those have to change in the future because of the health situation or, or another situation, um, you know, there should be openings to do that. And, and so I, I think, you know, seeing from a supplier standpoint, um, I think our biggest risk is, is doing nothing. Um, I think our greatest opportunity is uh, to continue working and working passionately with our individual uh, internal and external stakeholders uh, to, to, to move towards new bookings, but at the same time, uh, work with suppliers to be open to changes of those. We've seen and heard about through different associations like these, about all these many unique ways that, that people are coming up with to, to put together these new trips in this, in this current environment. And we all know that that type of trip that's sold, uh, individual parts of it will probably change, uh, just based upon the the the, uh, the market that we're in and and the approach of a vaccine or or any other type of testing that might might help us travel. So, continuing to move those travel opportunities forward, but also being open to to uh, to frequent changes. Uh, the push yeah. to fail fail fast, right? Um, rather than rather than sit back, make sure that that you're giving yourself an opportunity to make changes versus versus uh, lay back and let other people do the work. Yeah, yeah, good advice. Um, Emily, I have a question for you about when you think American travelers will be able to visit Lake Como or Bodrum <laughs> this year. I think if you want to get there, you'll yeah. manage to get there. Who wouldn't? Uh, you know, we hope this summer, right? I don't know. Listen, will the Americans come to in flocks to Lake Como this summer. I'm sure a select few will come. Yes. Our very famous general manager there. Manager there. Um, I know they're going to have some creative food and beverage opportunities. Yes. Will it be the local European market? Yeah, I'm sure it will be more of that. But it's just yeah. great to see we're going to have that, and that's just going to start. We, yeah. we just, you know, as Ted was saying, we, there's got to be some risk taking in this, right? We've got to try things. We just got to move forward. So we're looking forward to that and getting people back out. It's it's a a beautiful um, community that we're in, right? We're selling dreams and people are sitting there and they want to get out and do it soon. And so this summer, let's, let's see where that takes us. But uh, yeah, maybe yeah. private jet, you could get to Lake Como. <laughs> I think we'll, <laughs> we're, we're, looking, we're looking into that. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, private jets travel is certainly <laughs> very rising now, but yeah. um, getting into Italy and uh, elsewhere in Europe can may be a, a serious problem for us this summer. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, I want to thank you both. This was a great uh, panel. Thank you. You both had so much, thank so you. many interesting things to say. And also to thank everyone who joined us today and thank you for your intelligent questions. Um, and I hope you found this session useful. Uh, you'll be receiving an invitation to the next Power of, of the Collective session very soon. Uh, keep an eye out for that. And um, they, the goal of LE Miami is to make this content as useful and actionable as possible for you. So please get in touch with their team if you have questions or feedback. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the session and, <laughs> and, um, and that you have a wonderful day in, in the US and a wonderful evening in the UK and elsewhere. And thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you.